We are going to be in John chapter 6, verses 30 through 40. I know your bulletin says something different, uh, but also God had something different for me. <laughs> so we are going to be in John chapter 6, verses 30 through 40. And the title of the message today is The Bread Divided. Starting in verse 30. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given to me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. And this is the will of him who has sent me, that everyone who sees the Son believes in him and may have eternal life or everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Um, Dad, if you could... Uh, Open us in prayer, please. Dear Father, we thank you, Father, for your word, Lord. We thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for your security, Lord, that he shows in scripture that one say, always say, that we're in his hand, and his hand is the Father's hand. We pray, Father, that you touch the hearts here today, Lord, and let's just silence our minds, Father, silence our hearts, Lord, that the Holy Spirit might fall to each and every one of us, Lord. We pray, Father, those that are lost, that the hearts might touch, Lord, and that come forward and receive Jesus Christ, Lord. And those, Father, that are in need, Lord, you should bring comfort and peace to them, Father. And answer for it to their trials, to their trials, Lord. Strength, Father, we thank you again, Lord, for your, for your word, for the great Father, the living great Father, the eternal life, Father, that you give us in Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you will watch over us, God's the strength of us. We with the rest of the day, Father, as he brings the uh, word to us, Lord, and touches our heart, Father, with the Holy Spirit. And if I will be done, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. You guys be seated. So let's let's put a little context on this. Because it seems like we kind of just like cannibal right into this. So this is John chapter 6, and we're kind of coming to the end of it. Or it's kind of long, so. But before this, Jesus starts his miracles at Capernaum. He's healing the lame. He is healing the disease. He's casting out demons. He then, after performing all of that, uh, he gains a following. And this following is from all over Israel. All over. Because right now, he's, at, he's around the Sea of Galilee, and Scripture shows us that they were coming from all the way past Jerusalem. And that's roughly like 50 miles away. And they all came from that far away to see Jesus. So now he's got a massive crowd following him around. So while this crowd's following him around, we, we then see that Jesus goes and he uh, gives the sermon uh, on the mount. He feeds the 5,000, uh, he gives them the word, and then he departs. He departs because they perceive him to be their earthly king. They, they, <laughs> scripture says that they, come, they came to seize him to take him away and set him up as king. And Jesus, we know, did not come to set up his earthly kingdom. He came to set up his heavenly kingdom. So as Jesus departs, his disciples departed before him. So they went across the Sea of Galilee, and this whole, whole crowd saw that Jesus didn't get on the boat with them. So then the disciples go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. 
So they get to the other side. See Galilee, the, everything there happens, and then the whole crowd follows them over to the other side. When they get to the other side, they realize, Jesus, you didn't get on a boat with these guys. How did you get over here? And we all know how Jesus got over there, right? He walked Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Liam, you are, man, that is so good. Liam, you want to <laughs> My work is done. Let's see. <laughs> oh, man. Praise the Lord. So he walks on water, right? And then he gets in the boat with his disciples and he makes a cross. So now we pick up where that leaves off. The crowd has now followed them across and they're like, okay, we just saw all this happen. We saw all these miracles happen. We saw. All of this crazy stuff. We saw Jesus get across the Sea of Galilee without even getting into a boat. What's going on here? And this is where we pick up. He says, Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Section 1, Bread provided, Yahweh provides to show his character. The crowd was demanding a sign from Jesus. They just saw Jesus heal, like I said, they, we just saw Jesus heal the sick, the lame. We saw him cast out demons. They saw Jesus provide for all of this and supply a meal that had bread and fish for 5,000 people. They saw these miracles happen already. And now they're asking for more. They're saying... You know what? What else? What else are you going to do for me, Jesus? What else am I going to see? How many times have we been there? How many times have I been there saying, Jesus, I know you've provided for me in this way. I know I don't have to worry about this or that, or you've brought me through so much. But can you just show me one more time that you're God? Can you show me just one more time that you really are who you say you are? Israel was grumbling in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 16. They were grumbling because they had just come out of the land of Egypt. And just like the Israelites of Jesus' day, of grumbling, of saying, Jesus, what are you going to do for me? What are you going to perform for me? Just like that, the Israelites in Exodus did the same thing. They said, Oh, God. I've been out in, been out in the wilderness for a month now. Oh, I need something. We're going to die out here. If you look at Exodus 16, verse 4, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and your people shall go out. I'm sorry, I went too far. 16.11. 16.11, he says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard your grumblings of the sons of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall go eat meat, and at the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Just like the Israelites who are walking with Jesus, just like the Israelites who are walking with Moses, they were grumbling and asking for another sign. The Israelites just walked through the plagues of Egypt. They just walked across the Red Sea on dry land. They just got provided for, and now they were walking out into the promised land. About to, about a month in, they start complaining. How quickly do we forget the provisions of our God? They literally saw a sea split before their eyes. They literally saw Jesus take a basket of fish and bread and give it to his disciples and say, feed thousands of people. <coughs> How many times has God done something like that for us and we go a month later and we say, well, God, what are you going to do for me now? I can't believe I'm in this position. Oh, you just have totally forgot about me. 
I have been there. Am I the only one who has been there? <laughs> but why do you think Jesus performed all those miracles? Why do you think God provided the manna in the desert? It was to display to his people who he was. It was to display to his people that he said, I got you no matter what. He said, stop your complaining. I hear it already. You think God doesn't hear your complaining? You think God doesn't hear my complaining? You know, the, not, not the verbal complaining. I'm talking about the complaining of your heart, the complacency that's in there. God hears that. But guess what? He doesn't chastise you for it. Look, what, what's he do? He provides. Because that's God's character. God's character is to see that his children are provided for. And I'm not saying in excess. I'm not talking prosperity. I'm saying he sees that his children are taken care of. End of story. Now, not only did God show his character by displaying uh, and providing for their physical needs, later in the Exodus story, and we see later in in the New Testament, we see that God lays down his life for us. He provides for our spiritual need, which far surpasses our physical needs. <clears throat> Section 2, the bread provided, he is the bread of God. Verses 32, and then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. Let's pause there. Moses had nothing to do with it. I have nothing to do with my salvation. I have nothing to do with my provision. If you think you have something to do with it, you have it screwed up already. Because for so long did I walk in that delusion of thinking that I had it all figured out, that I could just be good enough to, to make it and do the churchy things and say the churchy words and know exactly the right answers. But in reality, I was doing it for myself and I wasn't building up the kingdom of God and accepting Jesus' lordship over my life. Let's continue on. Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread was provided by God himself. Now, don't, don't get this twisted or anything that, that man has anything to do with God's provision, because we don't. We, we, have, we are just vessels to his obedience. <clears throat> The Israelites align themselves with Moses as their father, right? So, as we see in the New Testament, we, we see that Moses gets elevated to a position where he is now eclipsing God to the Israelites. They elevated the, 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 the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, to a point of for putting them in, in front of God. That's who they were, they were going to. They were... That's who they, who they held in high esteem. So when they were saying Moses provided, they were looking at the man provision. They were looking at the physical provision. They weren't seeing where it was coming from. How many times do we see things happen in our own life where someone comes into our life and helps us out and gets us on the right path, but we, we don't take the time to look at the spiritual implications of where it came from? We don't see that God had a hand in it all, all at all, uh, all the time. <clears throat> now, they were missing the mark because Yahweh was their father. And Yahweh is our father. How often do, like I said, do we elevate people in authority in our lives and we forget God? How many times... Do I search out the wisdom of men rather than searching out the wisdom of the word? How many times have I stumbled and, and not gone to the Lord in prayer and seek his face? How, how many times 
have I gone to talk to my friends about something rather than sticking my face to the ground and praying to the Lord to guide me? Listen, this was, this was, <laughs> this was a hard message for, for myself because the Lord show, was showing me things in my life that, that I thought I had. You know, when you, think, <laughs> when you think you got something and God says, no, you don't. You're not, you don't even have a part of it. Man, this was, this was one of those times for me. Now, Jesus addressed the issue here by stating that the true bread of heaven is a person. He takes, he takes their whole idea of the provision of bread and just flips it on their head. He says, oh, you're looking at physical. He goes, well, guess what? The bread that you want isn't even bread. It is a person. It is someone who is going to be sent from heaven itself to come down, and he will bring life to the dead. Exodus 16, 4. Now we can go to that. Then, Lord, then Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread down from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota each day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Behold, I will rain bread from heaven. The provision comes from heaven. Our provision comes from heaven. Praise the Lord, it is Jesus. He came from heaven, he walked on this earth, he went to a cross, and he died, and guess what? He did not stay dead. Our provision is alive. Exodus 16, 4 connects the two, stating that the Lord is going to rain heaven down, or rain bread from heaven down. The same person that sent the bread from heaven is the same person that sent Jesus down. It is our mighty God, Yahweh. You see what, you see what God was doing here? He's connecting the two. Saying, I'm going to provide for my people by giving them manna. And then Jesus comes onto the scene and says, I am that bread and I'm going to provide. Jesus is going to give life to the world. Jesus has given life to the world. Now, if you have to give life to something... What is the other side of that? Something has to be dead, right? So why does Jesus have to come to bring life to the world? When we look around and we see plants, we see animals, and we were alive, right? We don't seem to be dead. But we know that in Scripture that at the very beginning, as soon as sin entered the world, death entered the world. Because Scripture says that the wages or the earnings or the things that we gain from sin is death. Now Jesus comes to reverse that. He comes to flip the entire script and says, you know what? I'm going to bring life to the world that is dead. <clears throat> the world is in need of life. And if you have accepted Christ into your heart, repented of your sins, and turned to Him and confessed Him as Lord, guess what? You have that life too. And He commissions us. His words before He ascended to the throne is to go. He didn't say, hang out, get together, worship on a Sunday, whatever day you want to worship, get together. His commission was to go. What are we doing during the week? Are we twiddling our thumbs just waiting? <whistles> Sunday's coming. <laughs> or are we out there actively diving into our worlds, into our friends, our family, our co-workers, people who we just come in contact with? Are we walking out and seeing that they're dead? They're dead. And what I have is life. Jesus in me is life. And if I don't give them Jesus, then they are going to die and go to hell. We had a man stop by on Thursday night. 
His name's Ben. So if you if you think about this, pray for him, please. He's traveling across countries. He's going from Boston. He's walking. He's walking from Boston to California. <coughs> and he stopped here at the church while we were here at youth. And he said, uh, hey, can I, um, can I just pitch my tent out back? Like, I'll be gone in the morning. Like, I'm just walking across country. So I was like, okay, I mean, I don't know. I'll see. I mean, I don't want to make that call, but be a weirdo. So I got to talk with him, and then I called Josh, and, and it, it all worked out. We're all still alive. <laughs> but long story short, I was a Josh and I were able to to take him out to breakfast to talk to him to see where he was, and he is running. I mean, he's, he's not just like, I don't want to talk about God. I'm saying that he, from his mouth, said, I cannot submit to the Lordship of Jesus. To hear somebody say that, and then know where they're going to go after they say that. That if he dies on his trek across country, without accepting Christ, he's going to hell. And my prayer was, Lord, just wreck his life. Make him see you. He said Pastor Josh was kind of harsh. But... <laughs> 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 but Pastor Josh, I will tell you, I was sitting right there. He was giving him the gospel. He called him a sinner. He said he needed to repent. And he said, if you call on Jesus, he said, you're going to be saved. He's... But from his mouth, he said, I cannot submit to the Lordship of Jesus. He said, maybe I'll figure it out when I get to California. So pray for him. His name is Ben. Life is found in the bread of God. Concluding point number two. Life is found in the bread of God. Point three. The bread provided Jesus is the bread of life. You see, to this point, he was just talking about the bread of heaven. And now this is when Jesus ties it all together in a pretty little bow. He says, Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Now our heart, our heart is desire, desires to be filled, right? Before we come to Christ, we are always desiring to fill it with something. Someone, uh, some act, drugs, alcohol, whatever you want to fill that with, that emptiness inside of you, whether it's religion, whether it's sin, however you want to fill it, our heart desires to be filled. And as we continue to fill it with things that is not Jesus, we are always going to come back hungry. We are always going to come back hungry and thirsty. Now, they're, they, they're still not even making it. They're not even connecting it yet. And don't start pointing fingers because it took me a long time to get the things connected. They're still thinking that I'm going to get provided with a bread that like I won't ever be hungry because they want to be provided for. This is not the bread they were talking about. This is not the bread Jesus was talking about. Now, Jesus says... I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and, shall, and who believes me shall never thirst. Jesus says, I am the bread of God. I am the bread of life. I am the source of life. I will bring to life what was dead. Now this is the, I, I cannot dig into this, but I really want to. This is the beginning of his I am statements. This is when Jesus starts connecting to the nation of Israel that I am the Messiah. I am the one you are looking for. Because that phrase, I am, is exactly the phrase we see in Exodus 
3.14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now when Jesus says, I am, red flag. Now he continues on to say this multiple times in multiple different ways. But right here, he is starting off and they're like, well, well hold up, hold up. Um, we've reserved that for some something really special, someone really special that I am. <clears throat> he is connecting the life-saving power and without question solidifies the validity of his messianic mantle. Let me say that again. He is connecting the life-saving power and without question solidifies the validity of his messianic mantle. When he says, I am the bread of life, right there he says that I am sent from God. I am the Messiah. I am the one that will be providing for you. I am bringing life to the dead. And now Jesus is carrying the, the mantle of Messiah. Now Jesus connects us to the Father by believing He is who He said He is. Until that point, we are disconnected from the Father. Jesus says, you will never hunger and you will never thirst. And the hunger and thirst is a longing and desire to fill ourselves. You can scour this entire universe. You can get the fanciest little teleporter that you want to you want to buy, because I'm pretty sure Elon Musk at this point is probably making a teleporter. He's going to start shooting people all over the place. But that, <laughs> going all over the universe, you will never find anything to satisfy you outside of Jesus. You may be satisfied for a moment, but eternal satisfaction lies in the bread of life, which is Jesus. Jesus fills that hole and will continue to fill us and satisfy our souls until we reach the promised land with Him. Now our promised land is, the he is heaven. When we reach the end of our life, be absent with the Father, or be absent from the bodies and be present with the Lord. And just like in Exodus 16.35, <clears throat> the Israelites had manna until the day they went into the promised land. God provided for them every single step until they made it to the promised land. Guess what? Jesus is going to provide for us in our souls so we don't have to search any longer to something to fill. Jesus provides that peace he fills that hole, and He gives us the provision to make it from this end of uh, this end of life to the end of our life. And praise God, eternity to follow. Including point number three: choose life. We have a choice. Choose. Life. Section four. Ooh, what, three guys off. Yeah, not four points. The bread provided. Believe and be raised. Believe and be raised. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet not believed. All that the Father has given to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. There were those who saw everything that Jesus did. There were those who followed him and saw, saw everything. They saw the miracles. They saw the healings. They saw the dead raised. They saw leprosy healed. They saw people fed at, over and over and over and over and over again. They saw these things. And yet, Jesus says, there are those who have seen me and still don't believe. 
Do you know people who have seen the work of God, who have heard the gospel and still don't believe? Because I do. I just met one. His name's Ben. They still thought... They still did not surrender and believe that he could actually be the Messiah. Are there days where, where we sit there and we see the acts of God and we're like, there's no way that could happen. There's no way that was God. Or we're just completely blind to it and we just say, oh, that's a cool thing that happened. That's dangerous. That's just coincidence. There's no coincidence to find appointments. There are those who are here listening and hearing the testimony of the Lord, and they're saying the same thing in their hearts. They're saying, what you're saying cannot, it cannot be. There's no way that it's that easy, that all we got to do is believe in this guy and just, you know, <clears throat> repent and say, I'm a sinner, and... And accept the Lordship of Jesus. That's it. God didn't make it complicated. Believe in your heart that Jesus is who he said he was, or is, he said he is. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. And what comes after that? You will be saved. That easy. It's not a script that we read. It's not a special verse that we read. It is you having an encounter with the God of the universe and you saying, you know what? I believe you. I believe I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus is who he said he is. All I, that's all I wanted to see from Ben. That's it. I wanted to see, see him have a change of heart and be like, yeah, you know what? I am running. But praise the Lord, he is not done. Praise the Lord, he is not done. Now, we're not just given this gift by simply being or existing. And the same thing with the manna in, in, uh, in Exodus. We, they were not just given the manna and being like, here, here's a pot of manna. We, I, God will supply everything you need. You had to do something. You had to go out, and you had to, they had to gather their provision. They had to gather the manna. Guess what Jesus is asking you to do? Believe. Jesus is asking you to just step out and say, you know what? I do believe. I believe you are the bread from heaven. I believe that you are the bread of life. That's what Jesus is asking us to do. Now before I surrendered to the Lord, I really wasn't satisfied. I really wasn't. I might have looked satisfied. I might have looked happy. I might have seemed like I had it all together. But inside, when I tried to fill those things with, with religion, when I tried to fill them with good things, when I tried to fill them with my wife and my house and my job, I came up short. I kept feeling like there was something else. And I believed I had Jesus. I believed it. But I never surrendered to the Lordship of of Jesus in my life. And let me tell you now, I am more satisfied than I have ever been. And praise the Lord, you can be satisfied too. And praise the Lord that Yeshua Jesus, my salvation, will never cast me out. Once we understand and confess to the Lord that He becomes our Lord. No matter what, we are sealed until the day of redemption. We are sealed until the day that He raises us. Jesus 
is who he said he was. Jesus embraces us. He adopts us. He calls us his own. Guess what? I am a child of God forever. Hallelujah. I am a child of God forever. I don't ever have to worry about God saying, well, you know what, Russell, you screwed up really bad that time. Uh, you got to try again. Or get to heaven and Jesus say, you know what, um, you weren't that good, so I'm going to you know, put you over here. I'm just, he embraces you, adopts you, sets you up as a son and daughter of the living God. <clears throat> Verses 38 and 34, or 30, 38 through 40. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who has sent me. This is the will of the Father who has sent me, that of all he has given to me, I should lose nothing. Now we get another glimpse of the character of God here. Jesus did not come down from some, with some hidden agenda to condemn the world. He came down to do the will of the Father and the one who sent him. So if you're trying to figure out what the will of the Father is, guess what? In uh, the next two verses, he tells you. I, like, I, I love scripture when, when Jesus does this. When you're like... Oh, I wonder what that means. And then like the next verse, Jesus is like, this is what this means. <laughs> it's easy for a dense, dense person like myself. <laughs> so, Jesus came to save him. He didn't come to condemn it. John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Is that, ex is that exclusive? I don't think so. I think he says the whole world, right? Verse 17. <clears throat> For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might, or through him might be saved. And he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of our only begotten Son of God, and that is the name Yeshua Jesus. People want to say God is, is manipulative. God is a, a kid upstairs with a magnifying glass. God, God just doesn't really care. Well, guess what? Those three verses just shot that completely out of the water. God cares about you. God sent his son for you. Every time I think about that, ever since I became a dad, to give up my son, I would rather die. But God said, you know what? The only provision for this world is my son, and I give him freely. That, I, I, I still do not understand that character of God. I, I still don't. And hallelujah, one day I will understand it when I see him face to face. <clears throat> now what is the will of the Father? He answers those in verses 39 and 40. And for, for all of those who come to faith in Jesus and believe that he is the bread provided, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, that he will give everlasting life. God's heart is that everyone who encounters Jesus comes to know him. But we have a choice. Even those who stood and witnessed everything that Jesus had done still didn't believe. Now where are we this morning? Are we going to take today and be obedient? Are we going to go and gather and partake in the bread of life? Because God is asking us this morning, are we going to step out and are we going to Accept Jesus, the bread of life. Are we going to walk through another week of unbelief? Now if we believe Jesus is who he said he is, we are going to be telling people about him. Are we going to be telling people that Jesus wants an everlasting relationship with them? And that his salvation is secure and never-ending? 
There's nothing that can take you out of the hand of the Father. Now, how did we just answer in our hearts? How did you just answer those questions in your heart? Including point number four, the bread provided. Do you believe? Now I'm going to end with two challenges. I'm a youth pastor. I love challenges, right? There's going to be a believer's challenge, and then there's going to be an unbeliever's challenge. For those who have accepted Jesus and his gift of being the fulfillment and the thread of life, if we believe What are we doing with this truth? If you really believe that you have the saving grace of the Lord Almighty and the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you, what are you doing with that truth? Are we hiding it? Because let me tell you, if you hide it, it didn't end too well with the Israelites when they took too, too much manna and kept it to themselves. It got rotten. And the unbelievers challenge. For those of you who, who have no idea what I'm talking about. Are you going to believe today? Because Jesus gives you an opportunity every time. Are you going to believe or are you going to reject? If you say not today, that's rejecting. Let's close in a word of prayer while we have an invitation. Jesus, I thank you so much for giving me this opportunity, Father, to, to present your word. Because if we do not stand on this word, Father, we have nothing. Your word is authority, your word is truth, and we stand on it. We believe every word, we believe every sentence, every chapter, that Jesus, you are the Lord. You are the bread provided. You are the only means of salvation. There is no other way that we can come to the Father but through you, Jesus. Today I ask that for believers this morning, if you feel that you need to commit to this challenge and you need to ask God to really show you what am I supposed to be doing with this truth, I pray that they would come this forward to uh, forward this morning, Jesus, and just surrender to that call. For those who are unbelieving this morning, Jesus, I pray that you would convict their heart, that you would make them so so uncomfortable in their seats, Father, that they would come forward and accept you, Jesus. Talk to me, talk to Pastor Josh, Dr. Carter, any of us, Jesus praying that they would come talk to us and that they would know that they have eternal life. I pray as I close, Lord, that your people would come. And just like every other week, if there is someone who needs to be baptized, that they would come forward. If someone that would like to join the church would come forward. But Father, I am calling this morning for someone to come to repentance this morning. Yes, Jesus. Pray this in your name, Yeshua Jesus. Amen.